Hi, I'm Patrick Fury. I'm the Dean of Wilkinson College at Chapman University. I've been there five years, and someone in the audience before we started asked me where I'm from, where my accent's from, and I'm going to give you a very brief rundown, and I'm going to introduce Pico. So I was born in England, and to an Irish father and English mother. They migrated to Australia when I was seven, and then when I was an adult, I went back and lived in England. <clears throat> That's why my accent doesn't sound like anything else in the world, and no country in the world understands me. <laughs> and I'm with Pika Ayer, who is probably one of the most famous novelists, authors, journalists, writers in the country, in glo globally. Um, I hope you've had a chance to read some of his work. It is truly impressive, truly beautiful, and its range and depth is extraordinary. We're very, very lucky to have him as a presidential fellow for the university. And Today we're going to talk about home and belonging and identity and I believe that some of you submitted questions and Pico has, has selected four. I looked through the questions and I think we both agree, amazing questions. You should be at university, mm. extraordinarily beautiful. Mm. I wish we had three hours to, to go through all of those questions because as I was reading them I thought, wow, 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 they're just, mm. they're just so, so insightful and, and, and interesting. So, Pico, I'm going to ask you the first one and then, and then I can respond. So this is the first one. Um, if you have so many places you love, how do you decide which is home and what is your personal definition of home? Hmm. <clears throat> well, and before I answer that, I'll just, in response to what you were saying, tell you a little bit about myself. And they were amazing questions and I'm still thinking, I'm going to be thinking for the next week and month about some of those questions and trying to come up with good answers. But um, as some of you know, and Patrick knows, I was born in England to parents from India. And then when I was seven, my parents moved to here in California. And in those days, it was cheaper for me to go back to school in England than to go to the local school in Santa Barbara. So I grew up going back and forth between California and England. Each week. <laughs> each, each season, yeah. Four times, three times a year I went back and forth. Really? So I really grew up on the plane, actually. Mm. And then uh, I li I've lived in Japan for the last 27 years. So quite a few of you asked variations on this really good question about what I consider as home. Uh, and in some ways, I choose a different answer depending on the context, which is going to be the most useful answer. Sometimes if I'm walking down the street in Cuba, for example, and they don't meet many people from the US, I say, I'm American, and that makes me very, very popular. Uh -huh. uh, and sometimes uh, if I'm elsewhere, I'll say I'm Indian, and people say, wow, you must be an expert on yoga or an expert on Mahatma Gandhi or something. And sometimes I say I'm Japanese, and then they really look surprised. <laughs> uh, but you know, I think when I was a kid, I really thought this was unusual and a privilege, actually, that I had bits of myself in many different cultures, but I didn't have to be confined to any one definition, the way my grandparents were. When my grandparents were born, they were 100% Indian, they lived their whole life in India, and they never really had a chance to imagine going elsewhere. And now, in your generation, even more than mine, so many of us have different parts of ourselves in, in different places. Uh, and when I was growing up, I thought, well, I'm, I'm lucky because if I were Indian, I might think of Pakistan as an enemy. Or if I call myself American, in those days I might have thought of the Soviet Union as evil empire. Or if I said I was British, then people from Australia and British colonies may have a bad impression. But I thought I can define myself in terms of my passions. And not in terms of a p one specific place, but a like work in progress. And you know, for example, if you're Mexican American, I'm sure that significant parts of yourself are from Mexico, other parts are American, but you may have friends who are from China or India or elsewhere, and suddenly your sense of home is like a collage, and it's a work in progress. It's something you're always extending. It's like a sentence or an essay you keep writing and you probably never get to the end of. And I think that's one of the exciting things about this new century. And I find that uh, when I was a kid, I felt alone because I, I couldn't define myself in one word. And if somebody said, where do you come from? Or where's your home? I couldn't, as you can tell, give a one word answer. But now, especially if I'm in a classroom, or especially in a place like Los Angeles or Orange County, most of the kids I meet are much more international than I am. Mm. And I feel well, we're forming a kind of tribe. And mm. I probably have more in common <coughs> with somebody in this room who might be Mexican-American but have an Iranian boyfriend or something 
than I do with anybody who's entirely Indian or entirely English mm. or entirely American. So it's an exciting new phenomenon. And the one other thing I'll say to continue this long answer is I'd always thought that home was not a piece of soil. There's really something in my soul. And my deepest home was not a country or a city or an address, but it was my wife, whom I've known for so long, and my faith and my favorite record and my favorite book and all those things I really care about that I carry around with me. And I, I'd always thought that. And then one day I was in my parents' house in Santa Barbara and I walked up and there were, we, we were surrounded by 70-foot flames and our house got wiped out in a forest fire, as happens to so many people in California. And then it became a literal truth because the morning after the fire, when I woke up, the only thing I had in the world was this toothbrush I just bought from an all-night <laughs> supermarket. And so, of course, if anybody then said, where's your home? I literally couldn't po point to any physical construction. Mm. My home had to be what I carried around inside me. Um, and I had to live what I'd always talked about. Um, mm. But so many people do, some refugees, some exiles, one way or another, that seems like almost the definition of the 21st century is that you have multiple homes and you try to bring them together in new combinations. And this gives me the chance, I've wanted to ask you, we've known each other for a few years and I've never had a chance to ask you of all the places that you have, which do you feel is home and which is especially close to you? How do you mm. think of home? I, I, I loved what you said and I love that, that idea you spoke about just then about <clears throat> there is a, a global citizenry that hasn't quite acquired the capacity to communicate with one another effectively because they still haven't identified. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I love that idea. But going back to that, that question, when I, I, I think we're all taught to, to, to think about home as a singularity. You know, there's no place like home. Mm -hmm. In other words, there is nothing else like home. Home is a single place. And it's an important thing for us to learn mm -hmm. as children and as we get older, our parents miss us when they send us off into the world, they say, you can always come home. And I remember my dad saying that to me when I left Australia to go back to England. <clears throat> you can always come home. And when I looked at this question, I realised that the mistake I'd been making all this time, and Pico's just articulated it beautifully, is that it's not that there's no place like home, it's that there is no such thing as home. There are homes. Mm -hmm. home, home is a plurality. <clears throat> we don't ever have just one home. I'll give you a couple of examples. When, when you leave your family home and you return to it, it is home, but it's not home anymore. You know, you know you are a visitor to your own home. Um, where I grew up in, in Australia was um, very poor, um, lots of migrants. Um, there was a, uh, a post-war migrant wave to Australia, a lot from Italy, Greece, England, Ireland. <clears throat> Um, and they came to the same spots. We, we, were, we were very poor, very uneducated. My parents didn't finish school. The idea of going to university was just never considered. The school I went to was very violent. Um, had a police presence, stabbings, bullying, rampant bullying. Never, never stopped, you know, just all the time. Um, ne not a safe place. <clears throat> I remember one day walking into the library and it felt like home. Wow. And, I, and I realised it felt like home <clears throat> because it offered, offered something of an opportunity and something different and something that, that resonated, security and safety. And so even though I'd never been there before, I recognised it as, as a home. And then when I went to university, that became even more of a home because all of a sudden I recognised things that I didn't know was inside of me. <clears throat> so in that sense, I have intellectual homes. Um, and they became things that spilt into a larger kind of sense of myself. When I think about a memory home, I, it, it, that's an impossibility, and I suspect you have a similar thing. Um, I, I think about my sister, who still lives in Australia, has always lived in Australia, lives with, my mother lives with her <clears throat> and her family um, in that kind of typical kind of generational home thing. And I, and I almost envy that they have an archive of home memories that, that I'll never have. What I have, though, is a multiplicity of these homes. I have a home, an emotional home in England. Uh, I have a family home in Australia. And I have this new home called America, which 
I identify now with in so many ways that I can't identify those, with those two other countries. I have three children. One was born in, in New Zealand, one was born in Australia, and one was born in England. Um, <clears throat> they, um, they have the same sense of the homelessness, which is a good feeling that Pico describes, the, the wandering home that you take with you. Um, <clears throat> and I think that the important thing is, is how you start realising that what is external to you attaches to what's internal to you, and that's when you start building the home within yourself and outside of yourself. Mm. <coughs> I, I also think we all have secret homes. Right. So, you know, I remember when I was a little kid, my parents would take me to a museum in California, and I'd see a painting from Japan, and somehow I would feel I recognised that painting the way more than I recognised the house where I was living or the, the house where I grew up. Mm. And it's a mysterious connection. I don't know why it is, but I think the way you sometimes meet a stranger and you feel that you know that person better mm. than you know your friends and family. We sometimes have that connection with other cultures and it's wonderful that this is the first <coughs> generation when we can go and visit those cultures and in my case, I actually live in Japan, the place that mysteriously speaks to me, mm. um, even though my bosses are all in this country. Um, but thanks to email and Skype and the like, I can live a long way from the office. Right. Um, Freud, who no doubt you've heard of, the psychoanalyst, um, describes that phenomenon. He talks about the unheimlich, the, mm -hmm. the uncanny. Mm -hmm. and, and unheimlich means both the, the, the familiar and the strange at the same time. Mm -hmm. So the, the uncanny feeling is, I kind of know this, but you can't know it. Or mm -hmm. this feels very familiar, and yet it's the first time I've encountered it. Mm -hmm. And that unheimlich, that's what you're mm -hmm. describing. Yes, yes. Why, why does this resonate? Yes. Why does this space resonate with me yeah. when I, I don't know it? Yeah. yeah it's and the fact I can't explain it means I trust it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, if I could put a reason, well, that's where my dad was living at that time, or that's the, the place where the house we bought, then it makes sense. But the fact it doesn't make sense makes me even more intrigued by it and yeah. feel that there's some deeper connection. And that's a great car bumper sticker. I can't explain it, therefore I trust it. <laughs> 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 it should be my philosophy in life from now on. Shall we go to the next question? Sure, sure. <laughs> okay. How do you go about being submersed into different cultures and not be totally thrown apart? Mm -hmm. Is there any sense of culture uh, shock that you face in a new area and society's reaction to you? I think one advantage of having a lot of homes, the way you were describing, is you're more adaptable. And if, you, if I'm suddenly in North Korea tomorrow or in Paraguay or Yemen or some of the places I've actually been, I don't feel totally thrown off because I'm used to being a foreigner, wherever I am. If mm. I'm in India, I'm a foreigner, I can't speak the language. If I'm right. in England, I'm a foreigner, I don't look like a lot of people around me. If I'm in the US, I'm a foreigner, I don't sound like the people in Santa Barbara. So that's fine with me. Uh, and the other thing I think I learned at an early age is I can't control what other people think of me. Right. Uh, some people will see my dark skin and think terrible things about me. Some people will see my dark skin and think wonderful things about me, but none of it actually has to do with me. And the mm. only thing that I can control is what I think of them. Right. Um, and uh, as you know, I've spent a lot of time with the Dalai Lama. And it's interesting, I've, I've known him since I was 17 and I travel with him every year. And because he's one of the best known people in the world, when I, I watch him and I see him going around the world and he says, well, some people say I'm a god and some people say I'm a devil. I'm just a regular guy. But whatever I say, whatever I do, there will always be some people who think I'm divine and some people who think I'm demonic. Right. So all I can do is try the best to be a good human being. Yeah. And you know, that's a good, good reminder. But it's certainly true there is a lot of culture shock. I could feel culture shock driving in Los Angeles, actually. And there are certain parts of LA that I know quite well and feel like they're familiar and safe, like your library. <laughs> and there are other parts where I don't have any orientation and I don't know where to go. And I'm may be in danger for that reason, and I certainly feel scared. Mm. So you don't have to go uh, to the other side of the world to feel disoriented or to feel a stranger. Uh, it's sometimes right in your hometown. Mm. Uh, and so I think most of us try to stick with the places where we can orient ourselves a bit, but there's an excitement in going to a place where we're going to get lost. Right. I mean, do, do you feel that? Or? Yeah, yeah. I, um, I've mentioned Freud already. Uh, my, part of my research area is, is psychoanalysis, and so psychoanalytic theory tells us that we are constantly being torn apart, that there are always inner conflicts, that, that, that what our psyche is trying to do is articulate things that 
um, can't be articulated or that, that we are repressing our desires that we want to express or that we are trying to come to terms with things that we don't necessarily believe in but we, to fit into society we have to go with. So this idea of being torn apart when you go to another culture I think is actually part of our day-to-day -day living and what I think is when you go to a different culture you get to experience it and if you're aware that that's going to happen, it's a wonderfully liberating thing. It's like you're describing, you know, it's, the newness can be quite breathtaking, good and breathtakingly bad. Um, and, and, and I agree with you. One of the most unnerving things about going somewhere new is knowing what is safe and what isn't safe and seeing the comfort of some people, the locals, and feeling a discomfort that you don't have that same association with those spaces. Um, it's, it's more than just survival, it's, it's how you feel a part of or apart from where, where you are. Mm. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful question because it addresses the notion of belonging as well. Yeah. How do you get to belong? And it's a, it's a complex relationship between how do I get to determine if I belong here, but also how does other people get to determine how I belong? And when we were warming up, someone in the audience asked if we'd been here before. And I'd been, this is the first time I've been in this space, and I thought, I don't belong here. I belong, somewhere, I belong in, the, in the cafe down the street or, or back in my office. Um, but you've been here before. Now, I don't know whether you feel like you belong here, but, but you must have a different relationship to this space than, than me. Yeah, no, I do feel at home here. And, you know, I've often been thinking Chapman has become my home now right. because I've been here each of the last 13 years and the last, this is my third straight year of spending a week here and every, every spring I come and I get to see you and familiar professors and it's wonderful to have a whole new, you know, five years ago I barely knew what Orange County was mm -hmm. and now it's got a, a permanent place in my heart and when I think about the places I go to every year and a regular feature of my life, there is orange. Yep. There's, and then I, I know, ex you know, I could find the Starbucks at the Circle Blind now. And yeah, yeah, yeah. I know how you know, where to get my best Mexican food, where to get the pizza. And so I feel really happy about that. But I agree, it's a, it's a, it's a very deep question because I also like the fact that the question was asking, how do you keep your identity mm. when you're surrounded by foreigners? And I think that's something all of us are facing because even if you've lived in orange your whole life, you're surrounded by more and more people from mm. Vietnam and Mexico and India and many in Australia and England and many other places. And so you have to keep asking um, that question. And I think the way I try to steady or ground myself is insofar as my home is inside me, that remains really constant. And so whether I'm in Orange or in Iran, my, my wife is still the same, my, the monastery I go to every year is still the same, the records I'm listening to are still the same, and that's a constant. And in a world that's moving around so much, you really need something strong and steady that doesn't change, yeah. that you can carry around inside you. I mean, mm -hmm. you must feel that the same way. Yeah, very um, much. And the interesting thing, we're talking about spatial homes and cultural homes, but I was just thinking about our audience and that generational um, home and, and identity. Do you remember that the, the concept, your age, the concept of the teenager is, is relatively new. It was pretty much invented culturally in the 1950s to 60s. You know, James Dean was kind of the first teenager. <laughs> so prior to that, the idea that there is this, this age that is somehow different from childhood to adulthood didn't exist. And even childhood didn't always exist. It, in, the, in, the, in the Middle Ages, there wasn't anything as childhood. They were just very small adults and they were treated like very small adults. <clears throat> so when we get culture shock, we also get culture shock moving from a child to a teenager, teenager to an adult. And the things that you are negotiating, the, 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 the complexities that you, you know, no one has the skills for at any age, you have to deal with, is culture shock. And it can be great and it can be incredibly difficult as well. And, and sometimes you're going to feel inside of you, the hell's going on? I don't, I don't understand this. Yeah. And, and that's culture shock. And, and we've experienced it across countries, but we yeah. do it through, through chronology too. Should we do number three? Yeah, except just one thing I was thinking. Two days ago, I think you confessed to me that you still support a London soccer team, which is probably what you, the team you supported when you were a little kid. Tottenham Hotspurs, yes. Yeah, and I was thinking, well, that's a kind of home. Wherever you are on the globe, whatever season or time of day it is, there's a constant. You're always flying the yes. Hotspur's flag, the white and black or whatever it is. That's yeah. right, yeah, yeah. and it's stuck on my door. And I actually, I have the Union Jack on the side, inside of my door <laughs> oh, as well. okay. Uh, <laughs> and they lost. Thank you for bringing that up. They lost today, so <clears throat> very okay. painful. 
Okay, do you feel at home uh, when you were writing and did you ever lose your passion for writing due to everything you've been through? You know, I think, I mean, another wonderful question. I, writing is my home. It's my mm. mobile home and my portable home. And I write by hand, so I've got my pen and my notebook here. My home is right in my pocket. Oh. And actually, I think, for me, writing is a blessing because whatever is going on in my life, sometimes quite turbulent or full of movement and commotion, writing is like a cabin in the woods. And I try to write every morning, and, and in the middle of tumult, I can just step away from the world and all the bombardment of experiences and confusions and emotions and go into that place and try to just steady myself and calm down and put everything that I've just experienced into a kind of perspective. So writing is like a sanctuary or an oasis. And as it happens, I'm a writer, so I try to live by writing. But even if I weren't a writer, I would try always to go to that space every day um, because the beauty of being a writer is that you get to take everything that's happened to you and try to extract the meaning or the order mm. out of it. I remember, in fact, the very night that my house burnt down, I was stuck on a mountain road for three hours and I was watching the fire pick through our house and, and, and wipe out everything we had in the world. And after three hours, I was finally safe to drive out down into town and I uh, crashed out on a friend's um, floor. That was the only place I had to sleep. But before I went to sleep, I wrote everything I felt and everything I could remember while I was in the middle of the fire. And mm. I thought, I've been through this devastation, I've lost everything in the world, but I've got something out of it important that, that is indelible and nobody can ever take away from me, which is my feeling and my account right in that writing. And I'm so grateful to writing for giving me a chance to talk back to the world and the circumstance. And life throws us all these things, and sometimes it defeats us, but we can have our own say. And you chose to write. That's significant, isn't it? In the yes. moment of insecurity, yes. writing gave you that. Yes, yeah. exactly. I was yeah. probably trying to construct my yeah. little home again yeah. in the middle of the night in yeah. a friend's house. Yeah. Do, you, yeah. You, you are articulating something you can control in a, in a, in a world that you have la lack of control. So and, true, yeah. yes, yes, yes. That's, that's what writing is for me. And yeah. I mean, I know you're very busy being an administrator and things, but I think writing is a part of your daily life probably or yeah um, I, very much I, it, I, um, I have to you know some people have to exercise I, I have to write I'm not, and I should contextualize this I, I've, I've written eight books um, but they're all turgid <laughs> and, and hard hard work and, and like, I, I give them sexy titles like theories of desire which you know isn't as good as it sounds uh, and, and a, a madness in cinema which is okay but you know another one was called theories of absence oh, yeah. I tried reading it, rereading it once. I thought, who published this? Uh, um, as opposed to Pico's writing, which just leaps off the page, and and you want to mine, you go, stay awake, stay awake, stay awake. But Pico's, you just want to keep turning the pages. They're just, it's just, it's alive and it's electric, and so you have to bear in mind that when we're talking, we're two different styles of authors, um, and that relates to this issue about this word of passion. And of course, passion was for a long time, big P passion associated with suffering. And then around about the, the early 1600s, it became a small P, like what we think of it now. Love that coffee, I'm passionate about that croissant. Just, you know, give it to me. Um, so, so this kind of, this, this, this extreme enthusiasm for something. Um, but I think we would probably agree with this, that writing contains both. It is about suffering and it is about enthusiasm. The, no matter how good yes. the writing goes, there's still an element of suffering because you, you think it's not good enough uh -huh. and I have to go back and it's still never quite good enough. Yeah. You know, passion, the word passion is actually closely related to patience, I found out. And, and I think even though they sound antithetical, to be passionate and patient at the same time sounds like you can't do it. But I think that's what writing is. It's a patient passion that, that in, in, in means enduring a certain amount of suffering so you can still love it at the end. Oh, fantastic, exactly. <laughs> and you're right, um, I didn't address the thing about losing my passion. And every other day when I go to my desk and I wake up and I sit my, pretty much my first five hours at the desk, I want to be anywhere except the desk. <laughs> I'm tired, and inspiration is not coming, it's really hard just to sit alone in one little corner of my apartment doing it. 
but I know that one day I'm going to be absolutely flat. And I just have to wait it out, exercise patience, and the next day I'm going to be more full of ideas than I know what to do with. And it's just a matter of waiting it out. So it's true. And the other thing I think is those hours, which are so frustrating, are actually not wasted. Mm. Um, because one way or another, I'm processing things and I'm working out my life and my experience, and that's going to help me more than if I was just racing from one appointment to the next and kind of living on the surface of life. That writing gives one ex an excuse for the luxury of thinking about oneself and facing one's demons and mm. facing one's angels too. It's, it's right. thing. Yeah. The, I, I imagine you feel this too. The, the beautiful about writing is that you can have a very clear idea where you're going to go with your writing, <laughs> but your writing may take you somewhere else. Yeah. And, and I, yeah. because I was just describing that thing of sitting, sitting down, and I remember this, I was working on this book and I sat there for, I don't know how long, felt like hours, probably about 10 minutes. But, and I thought, I can't, I can't, I can't write, I can't write. And I looked out the window and I saw a tree and I thought, I'll write about a tree. And I just, and it wasn't about trees or book or botanical <laughs> or anything like that. Um, it, was, it, was, it was a book on visual cultures. And I never expected to sit there and write about trees and trees and culture and what trees do in cultures and, and how they act and our, our representation of trees. But that moment of looking there was it enabled me to write. It was that synchronicity of things. Mm -hmm. And it was only because I was trying to write that I did that. Yeah. If I wasn't, I would never have thought about trees yeah. in that same way. Yeah. Do you, you must get that, that moment where I'm going to write about and then you look at what you've actually written and it's that wasn't what I started writing about. Every time. Yeah. And, and the writing is always wiser than I am. So I have my plan. Uh -huh. And at some point, maybe after a couple of paragraphs, the writing takes over. And I always know wherever it takes me, that's better than my plan ever could have been. Mm. That it has a, a mind of its own, actually. And yeah. that's, that's part of the excitement. Something is coming out of you I didn't even know I had inside me. And this um, must be why artists, writers, painters, filmmakers will often talk about a muse, something external yeah. to them which is yeah. guiding them. And, and, yes. and them. Yes. We've only got a few minutes left. Should we do the last question? Yes. Okay. Where do you get your creative inspiration? What do you like to do when you're not writing? It took me a long time. This goes straight to what we were just saying, to realize my best writing comes when I'm not at my desk. Mm. So I take walks every day, and that's actually when I come up with my best ideas. When I'm at my desk, it's very good for organizing material and putting A next to B and doing tiny stuff. But to come up with a big vision of how to start at the end or how to tell it from a totally different point of view, that I get just by taking walks. Yeah. I, go to, I play furious games of ping pong every evening with my neighbors do in Japan. You? I do. I haven't confessed this to you, but yeah. No. Don't take me on, Patrick. You'll regret it. But, um, <laughs> and, that, and I realized the 20-minute walk to the ping pong place, the 20-minute walk back is again where I have yeah. a lot of my best ideas. I love watching movies. I travel a lot because as a writer, you spend a lot of time at your desk, so you really need to go out and see the world and get a lot of experiences and then come back so you have something to work with. Um, and I think, like you, I love watching sports. I'm afraid since I was a kid, there's no sport I won't watch from mm -hmm. American football and baseball and basketball to soccer to tennis to you name it. Um, so, and it's good because all those things are very different from writing, but in some ways they invisibly complement and feed into it. Mm -hmm. you, do you watch sports much? Um, we don't get cable. Ah. I, I'm too cheap to pay for it. <laughs> <So> <laughs> I try to stare through the neighbor's window. <laughs> <laughs> Turn the channel. Oh, um, uh, yeah, I'll get arrested one day. Um, <laughs> but I do. When I can, I love watching soccer football and I love watching cricket. Um, I, I had this weird relationship with my father. My, my brothers were incredibly athletic. My, my youngest brother, I'm not exaggerating, he looks like Arnold Schwarzenegger. He's a huge, huge guy. Stupid, but huge, <laughs> muscular guy. And... and, and um, they attached themselves to my father in a way that I never could because I, you know, I was not athletic. So what I used to do is go to the library, read books on how to play tennis or how to play cricket, and, and then go and join the local soccer team. Or <laughs> say, oh. I know how to play because oh, <laughs> I read a book, uh, which I don't. Um, so yes, I do, I do, I do like doing that. Um, you said something I wanted to, wanted to follow up on then. About oh, that's right. The spaces. We, we have a series that we've done two, twice now, and I'm going to continue. And I mispronounced the word. Pico can say it the right word, but I'm going to the right way. I'm going to say it the wrong way. It's interstices, which is the space between things. And last year we did that on creativity. And it was all about the idea of 
literally when you sit down to write, that's when it gets hard. Mm -hmm. But when you're walking down to the ping pong table, ping pong table, or when you're making a cup of tea, or when you're walking from home to, to school, you think and you allow ideas just to circulate. And if you get into that habit, it's an extraordinary process. I promise you, you do this, and what will happen is once you get into it, you'll be able to go and you'll just go, right, and it will all be there. It'll just pour out of you. It may not be completely satisfying what, what you produce, but it does, it just goes. Tch, tch, tch. I've, I remember writing like 10,000 words in one day because the day before I'd walked and thought and just done nothing, bunked that, off. That's 40, page, 40 type pages, something yeah, like that. Yeah. One day, wow. Yeah, yeah. the tree. <laughs> yeah, I want that. <laughs> um, what else do I like to do? I, I, I love the wilderness. I, um, I have a saying that, that I told a, a colleague in England and he has adopted it, which is the more time I spend around faculty, the more I love trees. <laughs> and and w my family and I did a road trip up to Oregon and, and I, the, your, your, your state is just gorgeous. I, I, I hope that Americans realise just how beautiful America is. Mm. We drove up the coast, crossed the border of Oregon, came back down, camping the whole way, and lately we've been hiking in the San Rafael Mountains, going as far in as possible and just getting in and, and being as far away from everyone. Guilty pleasure, The Walking Dead. Do we know that? <laughs> We had some last night. Didn't yeah, we, we did. Yeah. <laughs> we did. Yeah. And you music. Seen? I think you listen to a lot of music, don't you? You know, I don't. Oh, okay. I sound like oh, I yeah, do. Yeah, you do. I know. People think I do, but I don't. All right. It's bizarre. Yeah. Do you? I'm not as much as I used to. But uh, living, you know, I live in the middle of nowhere, Japan, and uh, I don't know many people except my wife, so I have a lot of free time, and actually it means I can read a lot and watch movies and listen to music. So there I... Some, yeah, no. yeah, no, it's okay. I mean, I think many of us feel the big luxury now is time. Yeah. And so I moved to this place so I would have so many hours in the day and I can do all my work and play the ping pong and go for the walks <laughs> and do my emails and I still have time left over and I listen to music then, so. Time, um, yeah. it's a beautiful thing. Yeah. I think we're, we think we're out of time, which is, wasn't that nice? <laughs> we didn't even plan that. What a transition. I, I know. <laughs> um, I'm gonna ask you to thank Pico because he's a very, very special guest for us, so. Thank you, Pico. Thank you. And thank you, Patrick. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> thank you.